kind of, yeah, I knew it was coming. Yeah, there we go. All right. Sorry about 907. Uh, I was uploading highlight. Sorry. So that was, uh, that was me. My bad. <laughs> now, exactly, Sean. It, yeah, it is the, it is the, the Fox pregame kickoff element of all of this. Morning, uh, morning to the Guardian. Morning, Ricky. Um, yeah, so no, I, I was uploading highlights uh, from uh, yesterday. We got that to talk about. Morning, Parcival. Morning, Alex. How are we? Uh, so, obviously, we got Atlanta United to talk about. Uh, it's a reaction Monday, so it's whatever's on your mind in a uh, reaction Monday. And Bam, I know, wanted to, wants to talk about LAFC after surviving life at Geotis. And we got high school to talk about. We've got... Uh, Alex can laugh during the segment where we talk about the possible future uh, of uh, what's going on with uh, uh, Spurs. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, Sean. Spurs, my God. Yes, that is absolutely true. Uh, Jared will be joining us in hour number two. Uh, let's see. What else do we have this morning? Oh, yeah, we have a couple of other things uh, this morning that are kind of kickoffy. And I figured what I would do while everybody was getting settled. And, and well, no, Tom, you didn't have been any business winning it. because And we all know there are matches where you feel like you deserve to get full points and you don't for whatever reason. There are some days where you feel like you didn't deserve a damn thing and you end up getting full points. So, yeah, how does Austin lose to Carson? Uh there you go. Yes. And so we got all the relegation stuff to talk about. We got Premier League to talk about. We got all these kinds of things to talk about. So there's uh, it, it is wide open, uh, as always. So we can talk about, like I said, we can talk about Atlanta United and uh, everything there because we do have goals that can be played that are uh, reminding us about how, 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 or to be more like Ross and friends. Why? 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 And Rexham, absolutely. Uh, I was actually listening to BBC Radio Wales since I couldn't find BT Sport anywhere. Uh, uh, then uh, finding Rexham. Uh, yeah, well, and abs- well, Alex, considering that you scored five, was it five and 30, three and nine and five and 31? Yee. Well, and now there is talk this morning that Christian Stellini maybe sacked his caretaker manager after that. And, and there was, uh, and so we got that to talk about. And tomorrow, I want to bring in the discussion that they had on NBC about it with Tim Howard, Robbie Musto, and how it was laid out. Is it the players? Is it Stellini? And, and apparently, uh, since I did not watch the match, and Sean and Alex can fill me in on this, apparently Stellini went against type and tried to just absolutely try something random and uh, defensively and got absolutely exposed for it. So, uh, see, well done, Tom, buying the National League package for the one day. Uh, Well done. All right, so a bunch of things in opening kickoff. And uh, and Abby claims that she's going to come over here one day and fix this, the QR code, for those of you watching on Twitch. That's your QR code for everything going on at, uh, you know, with, with our friends at, uh, man, it's just, it is all over the place. You know, it's kickoff coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. Once again, use the code soccer down here, 15, to get 15% off your purchase. They in turn take 10%, roll it over into uh, youth leagues and youth initiatives. Very, very cool stuff from our friends at kickoff coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. So, uh, all right. Remember how, Remember how uh, we were talking around Easter and how I mentioned that Pepsi went off the rails. Here's your proof. For those of you who are watching on Twitch, I actually bought some right here. It's your Peeps flavored Pepsi. They claim it is artificial marshmallow flavored Pepsi. I saw this when I was heading into Mercedes Benz this weekend. Saw this when I was heading in, and I'm like, yep, I've got to do this. I literally have got to do this. So it it literally is for a public service just to remind us how sometimes you go off the rails. Well, I mean, well, Turner, come on now. Turner and Ricky know that I'm a Mountain Dew guy. 
and that being part of the the Pepsi uh, pyramid, then that's what I ended up doing. So, yeah, yeah, I did have to do this. It, it, it's that whole curiosity thing. So what I'm going to do before I have my, and it, by the way, for the record, I have my Mountain Dew right here. All right. So, uh, so, so uh, what you're saying, Ricky, you're kind of like the, uh, the, the old guard in, uh, was it uh, Last Crusade? where you're trying to, to drink water from the, the cup, and, and he chose poorly. So uh, that, that's what you're staring at here. So, all right. So this is it, – it won't take too long, Ricky, seriously. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. And there's the marshmallow after effect. And, yeah, there – see, and that's the thing, is that instead of it being like an immediate – taste it just kind of builds up and then it's like an after effect yeah so no nope 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 just reinforced my initial thought that that is not uh, that was not a wise choice even in the easter season that was uh, that was a poor choice an absolutely poor choice absolutely poor now, is it poor more well i'm hoping will more than anything i'm hoping that pepsi learned something I'm hoping that Pepsi learns something during Easter season. Don't do that. It's a bad idea. Bad idea, Jerry. Bad. It's just no, not happening. Uh, well, I mean, come on. So, all right. So the OG says, must I be reminded that my food takes and beverages fall into that are not good? Well, what? I mean, so my, what my take on on marsh on peeps flavored pepsi is bad because i thought it was bad explain but uh no so i i, I saw that and i'm like yeah I, I better see what it's all about and it's all about tasting like the inside of the can so uh not happening yeah that's just not good now uh to the other things that uh, i had this morning uh on in in kickoff in kickoff material so uh, all right. Now, and this is and this is, you know, for 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 fans of the game. And this is from our friends at Reuters. Beer thrown from the crowd caused a 15 minute stoppage to PSV Eindhoven's three nil home win over Ajax on Sunday. The second such incident of the weekend in the air to A cup of beer was hurled towards the pitch by a spectator, causing an immediate halt to the game in line with new policies aimed at stamping out bad behavior in the stands. A similar incident on Saturday caused the abandonment of the league match between second from bottom Grunigan and NEC Niemegen when a plastic cup of beer struck the assistant referee. The Grunigan NEC match is expected to be completed behind closed doors. Sunday's match was only halted temporarily because the beer thrown did not hit anyone on the field. Dutch football has been grappling with abuse from the stands and the throwing of objects after the Dutch Cup semi earlier this month between Ajax and Feyenoord where a cigarette lighter hurled from the stands in Rotterdam cut the head of Ajax midfielder uh, Davy Klaassen. The Football Association decided that all matches should be stopped immediately if a player or match official was hit by an object from the crowd. They also decided if an object is thrown from the terraces but misses, play will be temporarily stopped with the players sent to the dressing rooms. If it happens a second time, the match is immediately stopped. The win for uh, Ruud van Nistelrooy's PSV took them above Ajax in the second, five points behind Feyenoord. Luke de Jong scored twice. Javi Simons added the others. They beat Ajax for a third time this season. Two clubs meet again next Sunday in the Dutch Cup final in Rotterdam. So they're throwing beer in the air to Vizy. They're throwing beer. And we all know what happened in Major League Soccer, and in one building in particular, when you got when you had beer and water thrown. And honestly. That that's, you know, what you end up with, you know, that I think that that was probably the proper response. The one that was at Mercedes Benz Stadium where you have a beverage chucked at you and then you partake in the beverage and basically say that, you know, it was uh, it was just a bad idea. And I'm showing you how bad an idea it was. And then that fan should be chucked out of the of the uh, the stadium and should never have any uh, reason. I mean, literally wanted poster, you know. Have you seen this person? Don't do it first and foremost. And if you do, then you're out and you're done. You have no 
you know, no recourse, no reason. You have zero chance of ever getting back into this building for any circumstance whatsoever. A, don't do it. And B, if you do do it, then you deserve to get kicked out and charged with anything and everything and have the book thrown at you. So that's first and foremost. But apparently now it is taking over the air to Z and where you hit an AR with a beer. So um, I hope that uh, they find out who the idiots are. And I hope that they are exposed for being an idiot. And I hope that they never get to go inside an air to Z stadium ever again because of being an idiot. So uh, first off, don't be an idiot. Second, if you, if you are an idiot, you deserve to get kicked out and charged and see if you're a player and it doesn't hit you, then go ahead and take a swig and show that this is what Turner, this is what I'm saying. Why do people insist on wasting a perfectly good beer or beverage? Whatever whatever beverage of choice it is. If it's a water, you take your water bottle, you throw it, you take a beer. Why would you, considering how much beer costs these days in venues, why would you waste, what is it, 12 bucks? Morning, Sharif. Yeah, it was thousands wasted on the Gutman offside goal. Uh, Nick, good to see you, uh, by the way. Yes. Uh, so just, you know, considering all of the money that's spent on those beverages in the first place, and, and then you decide that you're going to chuck something into the air at a player, no. Just because you Just because you bought something doesn't mean that you have the right to do something. You're there as a spectator. You're not there to chuck beer at people that are trying to work. I mean, I understand the jettisoning and the celebrating and all the beer showers and all that kind of stuff. That I get. But don't be a moron like we seem to be having in, uh, it seems to be breaking out in the air to a Z, where you hit an AR. Frankly, I hope that whomever it is, they find them, they punish them, you don't get another match ever again. Beer showers are perfectly fine. But don't throw it at a player. Don't throw it at a coach. Don't throw it at a ref. Don't be stupid, comma, heir to the Z, fan, dot, dot, dot. So, yeah, that was, uh, that was uh, an interesting – that was interesting to see that we have instances now in the heir to the Z. So, uh, stupidity down here continues to, to increase and, and permeate other divisions that we previously had not seen. So uh, don't do it. Don't do it. Uh, all right. So Atlanta United, I know that, uh, I see, I, that I've taken the show once again. I know that once again, this will surprise none of you that I've taken the show off the rails and with the opening kickoff brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee. KickoffCoffeeCO.com. There's your QR code that will hopefully probably soon be repaired. And uh, you use that QR code and uh, use the code soccer down here 15. They take 15% off your purchase and then take 10% reinvest into the youth game. Very, very cool stuff from our friends at Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. All right. Atlanta United and Chicago. Uh, early on, and, you know, Nick, you mentioned the, the early goal. And like I said, we'll have Jared on here in hour number two to uh, discuss. We had the, the early goal where folks were offside in the fourth minute. And you could see early on that Atlanta United was working over the top, getting behind that defense of, of Chicago and getting uh, a lot of a lot of chances early on. I mean, the first 35 minutes, it was the Peachtree Press and it was Atlanta United. So uh, let's go back in time and go through the match. First off, here is uh, – let me see if I can find them here. One, two, three, four. Okay. Uh, we'll go with the, the visiting folks first and foremost. Here's how that first call was from our friends at Apple TV and MLS Season Pass, and it was uh, Steve Cangelosi and Danny Higginbotham on the call, and I'm hoping that my audio levels will behave. So here's the first goal of the match. Atlanta side with three wins and a draw this season at home. They've drawn each of the last two games they've played. Those were on the road. Almada. Long down the right side. Opportunity for Atlanta. This ball sent in. Here's Jaco Montes. And it's 1-0 Atlanta United. He's done it again. Goals in five consecutive starts. And one of the hottest players in the league has Mercedes-Benz Stadium alive. It's an Atlanta 
a side with three wins. And this is what happens when you don't take it out of loop. All right, so that was your uh, Steve Cangelosi, Danny Higginbotham call to make it 1-0. Let's go to the flip side, and how did uh, Micah and Jason call it? Here's uh, your highlights of goal number one. Courtesy of our friends at 92.9 The Game. Here is Sosa walking it up to the left halfway line where he flicks to Almada. Drop back to Parata who gives it to Almada again outside of center circle. Long diagonal looking for Lennon. Will it connect to the right end line? Yes, across. Back to Yakubakis in the spot. Shot. Score! Boom, Yakubakis! He has scored in his first Five starts for Atlanta United. But this is an exquisite team goal to give Atlanta United the 1-0 lead. And he ain't kidding. We drew it up at halftime. And shout out to uh, the crew that is that, that makes me and Joe Freihofer look great at the half. The crew at Mercedes-Benz. For those of you that missed it during Five Stripes Live, we had the layout of the play where... You had a couple of uh, two passes quickly, and then the ball from Almada was ridiculous. I feel like Jim Rome, ridiculous. And the to put it in a spot where Brooks Lennon ran like hell, got it just in the nick of time. Because remember, the entire ball has to cross over, and that's what they were looking at. Is they were looking to see if there was an angle where the ball was. You know, over the end line, and there was not because the the one that was definitive was the one from the other side of the goal. And then right at that moment, and I don't think the whole ball was over the end line, but right at the moment where you would anticipate that you would see the whole ball over the end line, then you see one of the the, the uh, all access photographer vests that kind of block vision. But the ball from Almada tracked down by Brooks, and, and I think in this, first off, the ball was fantastic. Second, that Brooks tracks it down the way that he does. I mean, you, Brooks. I mean, he, he hit afterburners. I mean, it was like fifth gear, and you just slammed it, and you went from like third to fifth and forget it. The fact that Brooks tracked it down and cut it back to Yakamakis, and it, the first defender let it go. The first defender for Chicago let it go past him. And then Yakamakis was there, and it was a slam dunk that made it 1-0. And, and we'll get into this. And and Tom makes the uh, and Tom makes the point. It, this was a match where everybody just kind of seemed off, and Chicago changed their approach a little bit, made it difficult. And what they wanted to do was, uh, and Ezra Henderson uh, Hendrickson, the head coach of Chicago, mentioned this after the match, is that they wanted to pin Almada in and make it difficult for him to function, and. That that worked for the most part in that match, and then you also uh, there was just there were a lot of passes that I think when you were trying to, you know, we're used to seeing passes in a you know very short space, a lot of passes, very short space. But then if you think that the long pass is there, there were a lot of long passes that that didn't have the right weight or that were anticipated really well by the Chicago defense and that created turnovers and then chances to come back the other way. So. Uh, you know, Atlanta United adjusting to the pressure that Chicago put on that created a lot of turnovers by Atlanta United chances for Chicago. And it just seemed like Atlanta United was defending, 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 defending a, a lot, trying to uh, get out of their own uh, defensive third and they were literally their own de the defensive half to try to get some offense going. And, and then you have to combine that with uh, a you've got a lead. B, you've got guys still fighting and fighting and fighting to keep that lead. Then you've got Open Cup midweek to think about. And that's when you started to see some of these substitutions. It's like, okay, I need you guys on Wednesday. And you could kind of sense, okay, I'm going to bring in, I'm going to bring in so-and-so to, you know, take care of so-and-so and that kind of a thing. So you had all of these things because I think it's, if it's maxed out, it's 14 matches in seven weeks for Atlanta United right now. So there's a lot of stuff that they've got to monitor and keep an eye on. And then obviously, Yakamakis was going to be uh, removed in the 60th anyway. Unfortunately, the hamstring balked again. So we'll keep an eye on that this week and see what's going on. I would not anticipate, uh, unless you get the, the best news humanly possible, 
that Yorgi Shakamakis would be at the fraction on Wednesday going up against Memphis 901. Um, we are going to be waiting news on Quentin Westberg this week. And Quentin Westberg got a knee injury in warmups, and it uh, it got worse on him, and it uh, started to swell. And so then he was substituted after 45. Clemon Jopp came in, and – this is the secondary reason that you want to have this kind of depth. And Atlanta United has this kind of depth in net because you had, at the beginning of the season, Brad Gazan, Quentin Westberg, Clement Jopp, and then you go down and you have you know Vicente Reyes, and then when he's healthy, Justin Garces down with the twos. And we can get into this once again with Jarrett when Jarrett comes in in hour number two. But that's why you have this depth. Number one reason is because you're looking to play in like 50 competitions this year in a perfect world. You're looking to play all through the playoffs in Major League Soccer. You've got Leagues Cup, and you've got Open Cup. So you're looking at 50 matches, and you needed to have this kind of depth assembled across the board, not just in net, but as it turns out, the depth in net that you needed is showing why you picked it up. And so Clemon Jopp comes in for the second half, and he's there to defend. He had a couple of good saves, and he was keeping Atlanta United. Uh, his He was doing his part to keep Atlanta United on top at one nil then just you know the the giveaway of giveaways from franco ibarra and i know that uh we'll get into that too but remember once again franco had the red card plus the injury that was attached to that red card incident and so you're bringing him in he's not in rhythm and he's still trying to fight back from the injury so you can see the, the, those are the the other factors attached to it. But then the pass, and it was a great save by Jop first off with Shabilko, but then you just can't get back up and square and get the, the second chance, and so it's 1-1. So it's 1-1, and pe- people started leaving and heading to the exits. Heading to the exits. So that's what you were staring at there. And then at 90 plus 11 billion, you end up with this moment, and it was right after a corner where it was a chance for the game winner, and I think it hit Brady in the face. I know a lot of folks were thinking it was a great save. I think he saved it with his face, and so that created the second corner in a row at nine at ninety nine minute at ninety plus nine. Once again, we'll start things off with the Apple call. Steve Cangelosi, Danny Higginbotham, courtesy of our friends. At MLS Season Pass, Apple TV, and Major League Soccer. Perhaps under a minute to play. Drilled across. Loose in the six, and it's in! The scramble in front of Atlanta goes ahead. It is Parata. The defender with a hat trick on his resume. Pierce who has just given Atlanta the victory late. Have in this scenario, more often than not, if a substitute comes on, someone is tasked with marking him. Watch Troll, number 30. Nobody goes anywhere near him. That creates absolute havoc. It's an own goal from Haile Selassie. It hits him twice and ends up in the back of So Danny Higginbotham explains one of the underrated aspects in this is that when Machope Chol came on, and it is so cool to see Machope just kick ass i'm loving it um machope goes to the near post and he goes to the near post and he starts to approach the ball no chicago fire defender tracked with him and so there's space that's created and the fire defenders are going okay who am i supposed to mark where am i supposed to go and it ends up purata it hits highly Selassie. Well, actually, I think it – let me try to remember. It hits highly Selassie on the left shoulder, hits Parata, then hits highly Selassie in the back, and then goes in past Brady for, for 2-1. So that was the Apple TV version. Here's how Mike and Jason called it on 92.9 The Game. Atlanta United will get one final corner attempt now with one minute to play in the match. Everyone up except the goalkeeper for Atlanta United. Yeah. Lennon puts it down in the far corner. Wiley will play safety along with Hosetu. Here's Lennon. In swinger edge of the six. And Parata scores! 
Air Force One bodies it into the goal. Atlanta United commits grand theft. Incredible. Smash and grab. As Juan Operata bodies it in at the post nearest us in Atlanta United appears to be on the verge to a last second win and after that play was called mike came back on and he was like yeah we got the chance to look at it you know and then we saw what happened but yeah it hit highly selassie twice and it goes in the back of the net so there's your uh there's your goals night and thing is is that this is the and I, opta had this number for the second time this year, Atlanta United has had a goal at 90 plus 9. I think it was 99.05, and it was Almada and San Jose. And 90 plus 9 was the one that we ended up with here. Two goals at 90 plus 9 this season. You did not have two goals at 90 plus nine in the last 14 years in Major League Soccer. Atlanta United has had two already this year. So, yeah, it was. Yeah, 90 plus nine and nine, 9909 and 9905 are the official times. So, yeah, four seconds, three seconds, yeah. So, yes. So, there you go. 2 1 smash and grab for Atlanta United. And Mike's not wrong. I mean, like we said, there there are times and there are games where you just sit there and it's like, we played like ish and got a win. And there are times when you play great and you either get a draw or something happens and you lose. The former happened for Atlanta United. Take the three points and run out of the building. Run out of the building. Eastern Conference, uh, Eastern Conference stats. New England and Cincinnati after match week nine, 20 points, both of them. New England's ahead on goal difference. They've already scored 15 goals this year. Atlanta is in third with 18 points, averaging two goals a match, 4-0 and one at home, and this is what you what you're supposed to do. Take care of business at home. Yes, there's stuff that you can learn from. And that's the idea going forward. But we mentioned how teams are successful. Taking care of business at home. New York City, fourth at 15 points. Crew, 14 points after match week nine. Nashville is at 12 points. Philly, D.C., Orlando all at 11 points. Philly's ahead on goal difference. DC's ahead of the purple team on goal scored. But we mentioned success. Right now, yes, we'll absolutely fire up the Steve Miller band. Home records for teams above the playoff bar in the East right now. New England 4 0 1. Cincinnati's won all five. Atlanta, NYC also at 4 0 1. Columbus, 3-0-1. Nashville's at 500 at 2-1-2. Philly's 3-1-1. Everybody else, 500 or below. Miami's actually at DRVP and K. They're 2-2 at home, and Montreal is 2-1 at home after eight match weeks. That's And that and that's the anomaly in all of this. Enter Miami, and uh, Joseph did not start, came in late, did not score, so that's seven in a row now. And if uh, and if uh, you get a you get Phil Neville who uh, sits Gonzalo Higuain down, that time's coming. Enter Miami's two and two at DRVP and K this year. Montreal's two and one at Stade Saputo because as we all know it is a difficult place to play. But Miami, after winning those first two games, has lost six in a row. Is Neville on the hot seat? And that was asked, and we can get into that either later today or tomorrow. He was asked about being on the hot seat. Montreal, 0-5 on the road, 2-1 at home. 
but they've also given up 17 goals in eight matches. Success in the West, taking care of business on at home. St. Louis is 3-1. and one. Seattle's 4-0-1. Oh, Bam, you're 4-0 and oh at home. You're 1-0-3 oh, away from home. So you haven't done a whole lot of damage to yourself away from home. Dallas at 3-1-1. One, one. San Jose's 4-0-1. Oh, Houston has won all four on the road. Minnesota, who we really have never figured out how to read, they're 3-2 and two on the road this year. Vancouver, 2-1-1 one, one at home. Salt Lake's 2-2. Two, and two. Portland's 2-1-1. One, and, one. and then everybody else is below 500. But once again, the teams toward the top are the ones that are at least getting points on the road, taking, business at, taking care of business at home. Atlanta, 4-0-1 oh, at home. 1-1-2 one, one, and two on the road. So that's where you are. And yeah, skewed by Columbus. Absolutely, it's skewed by Columbus. So that's where Atlanta United is right now. Like I said, obviously, we've got to take a peek at Quentin Westberg and Jorge Shakamakis. Take care of those two. Franco Ibarra getting healthy off of the injury. Because, man, that was a nasty injury that was a part of that play where he got the red in NYC. Ibarra getting healthy because, once again, I will maintain, Franco Ibarra has been a madman in the midfield for Atlanta United. We can look at the numbers before the red card, but this instant, this incident where he has the pass that creates the goal, that creates the equalizer, it's a moment. We talk about moments a lot. The moment that Franco Ibarra had should not detract from his season to date. Once again, injured, you're not in the main practice uh, discussion because you're not going to be playing off of the red card. So you weren't a part of practice really in Toronto. It's more about recovery. Then you're getting back into a rhythm. You're probably still not 100%. No idea how close to 100% he was. He goes out there, he makes a mistake. It was a mistake, it was a moment, learn from it, move on. Smash and grab, boom. Uh, speaking of coaches, Emilio's got the hot seat figured out. Losada, Latanzio get temporary reprieves. Vermees is my front runner, Neville moves up. And Tom, that's true. Nice to see a former striker's name barely mentioned anymore in the, S- in, the, uh, in the SMs, yeah. You aren't kidding. But, I mean, and so... Looking at, and quickly, Losada did get a temporary reprieve. Neville's on the list. Struber's on the list for more than just the fact that they're 1, 3, and 5. Latanzio got a reprieve for shutting out Columbus. And in the West, Vermes, Vanny, Robin Frazier, maybe? Josh Wolf. So you're looking at that right now, and I think that Salt Lake got a reprieve, considering that they're now at nine points and they're in the playoff run. So right now you're looking at uh, nine, eight or nine. Yeah, and like I said, Struber's up there for more than one reason. And uh, Dante Von Zier, I don't know if you saw the interview that he gave. And I'm not going to repeat the word. But the word that he used, he claimed, in the heat of the moment, you know, didn't know the meaning, whatever. And let me, I want to get it right, so hang on, um, since we're there. And so let me get, I want to get this right when it comes to what was said and we've also and on wednesday when bart comes in we'll talk to bart about what he thinks about u.s soccer being set to hire matt crocker as sporting director so the in in the interview dante von zier had with sporza belgian website He used the word that he used, which is disgusting, thinking that it meant the same as clown. 
He also uh, he also says he accepts he was wrong and he apologized. And there's a full interview in Dutch, and you can go to Tom Boger. Tommy Scoops uh, had the link to the interview at Sporza. I'm sorry that doesn't that doesn't wash. That doesn't wash. Anybody who knows the uh, the behavioral patterns and cultures and and how many times we've had stupidity down here on the show. Yeah, then use clown. Exactly. Then use the word clown. Exactly right. <sighs> Sorry, Dante Von Zier doesn't get a pass. It doesn't that does not that does not wash with me. Yeah, it is. It it it, it is uh it is dumbass logic. Yes, Tommy Scoops of the Athletic, by the way. So that's a good pickup for them. But, yeah, Von Zier to Sporza said he used the word that he used because he thought it meant the same as clown. And you know better it doesn't. Everything that, everything that we have talked about at Stupidity down here overseas with uh, racism down here that we have as a subset of Stupidity down here, yeah, racism down here, I'm sorry. Dante Von Zier, that does not wash with me. That does that does not sit with me. So, sorry. Uh, and, and I know that you have to make sure that everything is all laid out properly and legally before you make any kind of a decision on the future of Dante Von Zier Gerhard Struber, anyone else attached to that situation. You've got to have it all laid out. And I'm fairly certain that there are the equivalent of morals clauses in these contracts. But yeah, the Dante Von Zier interview at Sporza, just use the word clown. Use the word clown instead of what you did. So, Yeah. It is. And Will says it's especially because it's a much more European insult within sports. Uh, Carousel. Vermes could be off the hook if it weren't for the fact he's also responsible for bringing in the players, not just managing. Shouldn't have dismissed the possibility of taking the M&T job so abruptly. He may need a job soon. True. What's that conversation like? If you're sporting director or GM or whatever, DT, whatever you want to call yourself, and head coach. Are you sitting behind your DT desk with an empty chair in front of you? Peter, I'd like to talk to you, you know, technical director to coach. And he wanders around, sits in the other chair. Okay, what would you like to talk about? Wanders back around, sits back in the other chair. I don't think you should be coach anymore. He wanders back around. I don't know. I could challenge that. Wanders back around. How would you, cha- you know, how, how is that conversation? Do you have it in a mirror? Is there a mirror in that chair? How do you have this conversation if you're Peter Vermes? Are others in the room? How do you how do you do that? That's that's my question. How do you have that conversation if you're if you're Peter Vermes? And if you're the owners of sporting, when do you have that conversation? Because this is not good. This is not good. Three goals scored. Actually, you might actually you may have more goals now than red cards. 13 allowed in uh, nine matches, but you've only scored three. You have as many points as you have goals. As many points as you have goals. You are 0-2-1 at home, 0-4-2 on the road. And so there's that. And L.A., Vanny getting a bit of a reprieve. Or are, we, are we agreeing that Vanny got at least a weekly reprieve, or at least this week he got the reprieve? Because Emilio says, Austin reminds me of ourselves in 2020, pandemic aside, but with better talent. L.A., 2-0 winners over Austin. What is going on with Verde right now? What's going on, at least part and parcel, is that everybody's pinned in on Driussi and no one else is stepping up to try to score goals. 2-4-2. Six goals scored in eight matches. I know a lot of folks might have been looking at Maxi Arruti to help out with the goal scoring. But you've given up 12 
So that's a goal and a half. That's a, a goals against of one and a half. I mean, now, see, uh, see now, what Will, what you've done is, is you've opened a door for me. And I know at some point I am going to have to uh, get the appropriate drop, and I'm writing it down so I don't forget. There's going to have to be a drop that I'm going to have to use now that you've mentioned that particular pun. Now I know that I need to have that one there. Uh, Well, okay. All right. So, like I said, we'll get into it. When Jarrett comes in in hour number two, we'll also talk more about Atlanta United. We'll talk about them tomorrow as well. So Atlanta United's on the table, and literally I'm just flying by what you guys are talking about in the Twitch pitch. Ricky, Austin by far, most disappointing team this year. All right. So is Austin the uh, most disappointing team this year? And so, of course, uh, we've got that. Dylan Butler, we'll talk to him about this on Wednesday. He had the article with Josh Wolf. Josh Wolf following the loss. Frustration. Josh Wolf highlighting decisions by referee Chris Penso that were tough to stomach. Morning, Abby. Yeah, second half was hard to watch. We'll talk about it this morning. So, Josh Wolf highlighting decisions by Chris Penso that were tough to stomach. Quote, I think a lot of Chris Penso. I think he's the best in the league. I thought it was tough to watch tonight. Refereeing is very, very challenging, but these don't seem like real hard ones. I thought he was poor, extremely poor on the night. Wolf also claimed that the Galaxy star players, Chicharito and Ricky Puj, received preferential treatment not given to Sebastian Driussi. Chicharito, Ricky, these are good players. They got protected a lot tonight. They really did. We have a few good players out there on the team tonight, and I thought it was a real lack of respect for what is one of the best players in the league. Obviously not his best year, but some of the decision-making and the leadership on the field from the referees I thought was tough to stomach. Austin has gone 355 straight minutes without scoring a goal. Ragoni... 15 appearances, no goal or assist in MLS play, DP winger. Rodney Redis, 40 appearances, one assist. That's your U22 winger. That's what you're staring at with uh, with Austin. Now, also, Toronto. Yeah, I mean... Ricky, given what they did last year, expectations, performances, not sure who else it could be. What about Toronto? Toronto ain't all that. Toronto's got issues. You know, we talk about what's going on with them. Toronto, one, two, and six. Big Shot Bob is trying to uh, draw his way through the season. What's the record for draws in a year? Draws in a season in a Major League Soccer, provided I could spell season. All right. Most draws achieved by a team during a regular season is 18. Fire in 14, Nashville in 21. So, right now, if... Toronto was to continue their pace, they would end up with four, three and a half, 22 draws. Like I said, this is just if they keep pace. So 18 draws is the most. Toronto, through one quarter of the season, is already one third of the way there. One, two, and six. They score a lot. I mean, they've they've scored 12 in uh, – well, actually, they don't score a lot. My bad. Uh, they've scored 12, but they've given up 13, and they just scream average or below average. 
And I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, they scored 12. That's a lot. Uh, let's see who scored less. Montreal, Miami, Red Bulls, Charlotte, Orlando, D.C., Nashville. So six teams have scored less out of 15. So Toronto's tied for eighth because NYC and Cincinnati and uh, Chicago have all scored 12. So fifth, tied for fifth. So they've tied for fifth in goals scored. And, yeah, and obviously not having, as Coco says, not having Insigne, Lord's expectations for them, at least for at least for Coco. And you saw what it's like when, when Insigne and Bernardeschi are there. A- and Crescito is not. You've seen what it's like for them to work offensively and get what it is that they that they wanted with this combination. But once again, that back line ain't helping you. And then when you've got injuries and one's injured, one isn't, and you're going back and forth and trying to figure it all out, you're like, ma. And I'm sure if you're a Toronto fan, I think you're frustrated. Miami's been hideous after winning that first two, especially. Austin, disappointing. Uh and then Abby on the comment from Josh Wolf, she's got a hard time with the comment about refs showing respect for certain players. Call the game as it should be called, no matter who the player is. Foul's a foul. Emilio protecting the player, respecting the player, not the same thing. It needs to be the former. But that's what you're staring at, you know? You got you got teams in trouble. Like I said, we're eight, nine matches in. You got managers in trouble. You got teams in trouble. And right now, Atlanta got a smash and grab, and they are out the door. And that's what you need. And you're looking at Open Cup in the midweek. Now, And this is where the schedule really gets hairy. Because tomorrow and Wednesday, you, you've got a boatload, boatload, of Open Cup games involving MLS teams. So Atlanta had the last match. At least they weren't scheduled for Tuesday in the Open Cup. Obviously, we'll talk Open Cup a lot this week. You've got MLS teams. St. Louis City gets the Murder Owls tomorrow night at 8. Sporting gets Tulsa Athletic at Children's Mercy Park at 8.30. Earthquakes go to Monterey Bay and play at Cardinal unless they play at East Bay. And then you've got uh, CONCACAF semi with uh, Tigres and Leon. So everything is happening right now. Wednesday, Cincinnati and Louisville, who don't like each other. Atlanta and Memphis at 7.30 up at the fraction. Columbus and Indy 11. D.C. and Richmond kickers. That one will be fun. Your Miami Derby. In Boca, so it's Boca versus Fort Lauderdale with the Miami FC against Inter-Miami. Houston traveling to Tampa, Chicago and Chicago House in Bridgeview, Nashville and San Antonio, Colorado, Northern Colorado, that one will be fun. Eamon Zayed has been taking a lot of wins that a lot of folks were like, oh, no, Northern Colorado shouldn't be able to win that one, and they do. Is Northern Colorado this year's murder owls. Philadelphia had LAFC in Champions League is Wednesday. Vegas and Salt Lake is Wednesday night in Open Cup. Seattle and Portland have home games in Open Cup on Wednesday night late. Then you've got to turn around. And you've got Nashville in Nashville. Nashville in Atlanta. The early game on Big Fox Saturday afternoon. The big That's the game on Big Fox. And apparently it is going to be the number one Apple crew that is going to be doing it. It's on the free side of Apple TV. It's going to be Jake and Taylor. Because apparently he's already said that they're doing it. So you go from... 
Open Cup Wednesday night to the first match Saturday afternoon. Three matches in six days for Atlanta United. Late yesterday, Wednesday Open Cup, and the first match of the weekend against Nashville. Just get out of Geotis with a point, and if you end up with more, fantastic. But Nashville isn't scoring. And I want to, it will be interesting to see what the lineup looks like for Atlanta United Wednesday, knowing that folks were being pulled to get prepared for Wednesday. Then having to turn around and be the early match Saturday in Nashville. I think some rotation could be afoot. So then there's that. So you've got, this is that first stretch of madness that you're staring at right now if you're a fan of Atlanta United. Yeah, bam, basically, yeah. Get a point, get the hell out of Dodge. Yeah, because Rich has CCL on Wednesday. So not everybody, not everybody is, uh, not everybody's in open cup, but everybody's got something going on. Tom? You've got League's Cup coming not too far away. This absolutely must fix the roster rules and allow for expansion. You're going to kill your own product. And, and I think that, Tom, I think that what we talked about here, because as, as we all know here on this show, we solve the world's problems. The world just needs to listen. What you need is instead of the certain number of emergency call-ups, I think that number needs to be expanded. I think it's was it emergency call-ups. I think it's, what, four? Or it's like six, and you can only use a player for a certain number. The number of call-ups, I think, can be increased. And the number of usages attached to those call-ups needs to increase. Three full games in 154 hours. Thank you, Abby. Yeah, that's what that's what you're staring at. But you've got to look at roster allowances, especially here in a year like this. What this is going to do with, and and this will be that first test of it. This, for those of us who have been looking at rosters, roster depth, we've been looking at opponents, we've been looking at what, what it looks like and looking at what it is from an Atlanta United perspective. The roster was built for a certain reason. It's built for a playoff run, built for an Open Cup run, and League's Cup. Like I said, like we said going in, you're looking at like 50 matchups if you play out the whole thing. 34 regular season, you know, then you're looking at two, maybe what, 40 40, 42, if you get all the way through in, uh, so it might be a little more north of 50, so like 53 or so, if you go all the way in Leagues Cup, all the way in Open Cup, and all the way in Major League Soccer. The the emergency call-up has to be altered. I think it I think it has to be, especially in a year like this, and I think that what teams will do is they will look at the injuries, the rotation, all of that empirical data, and hopefully they can go to New York and go, see, you know, this is what we had to face this year. Things need to change. I think that your salary cap obviously needs to, I think your salary cap needs to change. Yes, Sean, it actually is a new slogan for the morning. We solve the world problems. The world just needs to listen. That's a T-shirt. Hudson, that's a T-shirt. Uh Tom, add another DP, absolutely. Increase call-ups, absolutely. Have those players available for usage because you can call them up, but you can't, but you can only use them a certain number of times. That needs to get wiped off the board. That needs to get wiped off the board and expand the rosters to 40. It's very major league baseball of you. Burned. By the way, it's good to see you burned at River Ridge the other day. First roster rule MLS needs to change is the number of senior roster spots. You can't have a realistic first division squad with 18 senior players. 
That's laughable. You need more than that. So that's what you're staring at. Knicks, or as those programmers say, I'd love to change the world, but they won't give me the source code. Yeah, and that's, you know, with a player like Eric Lopez, who is, and, and Nick Firmino. I mean, and, okay, so when Jarrett comes in, we will have this discussion as well about rosters and the twos. And if you guys haven't had the chance to either listen to us on the network calling the twos matches or, you know, going to the fraction, you have players available to you that, and I got to talk to Gonzalo Pineda about it yesterday and asked him about it after the, the press conference was online uh, about folks that are benefiting. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. Is it, well, This is what you need, Rich. You need more openness of movement. You honestly do. Among the first, second, and third teams, you need that openness of movement, especially with all these competitions. Rich, I think you could agree here with this. I mean, if you could bring in, if you could bring in Odada to help you out on a weekend, then you're going to sit there and it's like, yeah, man, I want that. I absolutely want that. That's what you're hunting for here in these situations. You know, Rich, if you're looking at if you're looking at Union Two, and you can bring in. Uh, Stefan Stojanovic, if you can bring in, you know, if you can bring in uh, a Jose Brizuela, you know, you could bring in a Jeremy Raffanello. You know, if you could bring in those players, you bring in a, a Brandon Craig. When you need them, I mean, think about think about your week, Rich. Think about what your week is. You play and you and you survive, you know. You put four on the board in Toronto. That one was over early. You put four on the board, you win. And then you've got CONCACAF Champions League semi in the midweek. And then you luck out because the schedule maker was like, you know what? Y'all are in a rough spot. We'll give you a bye week after CONCACAF Champions League. I think you and LAFC got the bye week this weekend. Or did LAFC, did, did LAFC not get it? If I'm trying to remember, bam, help me out. No, you both did. Okay, so both, yeah, both LAFC and Philadelphia got the buys after the first round of the of the, the uh, CONCACAF semi. So the, the schedule maker was, was kind there. But you got teams in Open Cup that have Sunday, Wednesday, Saturday. That's a part of this process. That is something that if you've got a roster of 18 – without increased emergency call-ups or without just the capability of calling up. And, yeah, Burned, the, the larger issue is that you need to have a larger roster for your game day. But if Rich could bring up a Craig or a Raffanello or somebody like that, then Burn is fixing the world's problems. We'll get to that in a second. Where Atlanta United could have access to the following people. To the following people. Luke Brennan, Eric Lopez, Aiden McFadden, Johnny Fortune, Kofi Tumasi, Vicente Reyes at this point. Luis, uh, you, know, you got uh, Firmino, Nick Firmino available to you. No, oh, and thank you for it's I I thought that there was something with the with the buys. You already had the buy, Rich. Okay, thank you. LAFC didn't, yeah. MLS moved the LAFC match. Uh for 
Atlanta, if you could add, if you go from 18 to 24, so here's how Byrne was fixing the world. You need to be allowed 24 senior roster spots, two deep on every position with actual professionals, six homegrown supplementals. On top of that, unlimited call-ups from the second team in the academy. So you're looking at 24 plus six and unlimited call-ups. I love I, the unlimited call-ups. I think you need, especially within a year with multiple competitions. 24 senior spots, but yeah, right now with 18 slash 21 with the Atlanta United lineup that they had going up against Chicago Fire 2. And I love secondarily, I love having the matchup where you're playing the first team and the second team back-to-back days. I love that. It's great scheduling by MLS Next Pro and Major League Soccer. So here's what here's what you could here's what you could do as we fix the world's problems here. You could add Luke Brennan, Eric Lopez, Nick Firmino, Kofi Tumasi, Johnny Fortune, Tyler Young, Noah Cobb, Efren Morales is doing really well, Aiden McFadden, Vicente Reyes, and Eric Centeno. That was your starting eleven against Chicago Fire Two. That was your starting eleven. Lopez, Brennan, Firmino, Centeno, Tumasi, Fortune, McFadden, Morales, Cobb, Tyler Young, and Vicente Reyes. That's what you had. You know, David Mejia could help you out in the midfield. So for clubs that have this kind of thing and this kind of availability, when you've got three matches in a week, you need to have that unlimited up and down and being able to move to where I can make a phone call and I mean, we see it in baseball all the time. Hey, I need somebody to to come down from Gwinnett. All they got to do is hit the freeway and go over the top end and show up at at the show up in Cobb County. You're going from Gwinnett County to Cobb County on an emergency, or even if it's not an emergency, you're going from Gwinnett County to Cobb County to help out the parent club. For Atlanta United, you'd be going from Cobb County downtown, just like that. And that's what you need. But 18, 18 available to you on a game day, especially with multiple competitions. What I'm hoping across the board is that these clubs in Major League Soccer, as a part of their analytics department, will have empirical data to go with their physio department about treatment of athletes and what this schedule is doing to them. Or and, or and or did to them when this is done. This is done. That's, that's what you're staring at. So you need to have larger rosters available to you. And the unlimited call-up thing for me is huge. And what it does is it absolutely helps out clubs that have that Borg mentality. You're discussing the collective. That's what you're doing. You're, you're in the collective, and everyone is working toward the collective. Second team toward the collective. First team, part of the collective. Everyone's on the same page. And when you've got 50-plus competitions that you could possibly be in, you need to have things be different when it comes to, to roster makeup and status and availability. I think that this year... Toward the and like I said, toward the end of all of this competition, when League's Cup is done, when Open Cup is figured out, and everyone's just racing for a Major League Soccer title for MLS Cup, it will be interesting to see what the injury situations are, especially coming out of League's Cup and going down the stretch. See what the injury situation is in these clubs, and the well, and ban the fact that they took a month off. Because Well, because League's Cup, and Bam's major point is, is that League's Cup is what's going to kill everyone. It may not necessarily be League's Cup itself, considering you're taking a month off of Major League Soccer. But it might be the knock-on effect going in, because as Gonzalo Pineda said yesterday, it's 14 matches in seven weeks. And then the sprint after League's Cup. 
because of all the matches that you're going to be playing to finish your season. So that's what that's what you're looking at here. And I, like I said, I don't think BAM it's League's Cup itself. I think that it's everything leading into League's Cup where you get your schedule compression and everything going out of League's Cup to the sprint playoffs. So that's what that's what we're staring at here. Uh, hour number two would not be complete with Jared Smith. Wouldn't be complete with me? Oh, it's, well, we can kill it then. Absolutely. Okay, fair enough. Um, we're fixing the world's problems, Jared. Again? Nice. Yes. What are we yes. doing now? Um, it has to do with uh, roster size, manipulation, emergency call-ups, all of that because of, and this it was a byproduct of the discussion that we had involving the injury to Quentin Westberg and the yeah. injury to Jorgis Yakamakis as you are heading into, yes, you did, Jason. He was asking questions at the presser yesterday. And the after effects of going from a match on a Sunday to open cup in the midweek to being the first match of the weekend on Saturday. And Gonzalo Pineda said in the press conference yesterday, 14 matches in seven weeks. And where, and Bam says that League's Cup is going to kill everyone. And I would maintain that it won't be League's Cup itself, but it will be the 14 matches in seven in seven weeks leading into League's Cup and then the sprint to the playoffs and the playoffs after League's Cup. League's Cup by itself won't kill everyone. League's Cup will be one of the many people standing over the broken bodies with a bloody lead pipe. Mm -hmm. There will be many people, in this case, tournaments and processes, that will be standing over the bloodied corpses of many MLS teams' rosters. League's Cup is just one of them standing over there in the angry mob. And Burns said that having 18 players is ridiculous. He says you need to be at least allowed at least 24 and then you have six homegrowns or supplementals, and on top of that, unlimited call-ups from the second team in academy. Tom had mentioned the fourth DP and salary and knocking off salary constraints and things like that where you can make sure that you have a roster that is squared away for north of 50 matches. I think that Atlanta United, with the first and the second team, is capable of doing that. It will be difficult juggling under the current construct considering what we saw at the fraction on – on uh, Saturday where you had and I mentioned this lineup that really could go a long way in helping out Atlanta United in, in other competitions if you had the, the call-ups as such. Eric Lopez, Luke Brennan, Nick Firmino, Centeno, Kofi Tumasi, Johnny Fortune, Tyler Young, Noah Cobb, Efren Morales, Aiden McFadden, Vicente Reyes. Those 11 could truly help your first team out in this situation if roster rules and construction were loosened to be more logical with the multiple competitions. Yeah. And it's going to be. You should loosen up. You, you should be. We've been screaming this. Um, I know I have for a while that, yeah, you need to loosen up these restrictions. Yeah. If you're going to, especially if you're going to start putting in more. Um, more chaos into into your schedule, like you know, League's Cup. Um, you know, so U.S. Open Cup is always going to be there. Yeah, uh, people start getting involved in Concacaf Champions League. Um, you got to you got to find a way to loosen it up. And and though we've ranted about it in the past, I do want to clarify, like some of this has to do with the fact that the NCAA's brain is actually made of gerbil pellets. Mm-hmm. Um, be, never forget that the NCAA went in front of Congress. Um, or the Supreme Court, excuse me, and basically put together one of the most BS, pathetic, you know, you know, wet piece of paper arguments anyone had ever seen. Um, because also remember with the NCAA leadership, um, just because someone has the leadership position does not mean they are smart or great at what they do. They just finesse their way to a really good situation. It doesn't make them better than you or anyone else. And it doesn't make them a genius. Don't feel bad about your life if you're not head of the NCAA. Uh, you're still probably doing better than they are in some respects. Um, yeah, you, you, these kids in the academy can play, uh, could play in USL last year, which is a professional league, um, but and not wreck their eligibility. But if they played an MLS out of the academy, they would wreck their eligibility because, again, the NCAA's brains are gerbil pellets, and <laughs> nothing about them makes sense. If 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 you could figure out a way, I would it would. It would behoove everyone, I think, to figure out a way to say, hey, what if we just had kids come from the academy 
got called up and could play MLS games Mm -hmm. and not tank their eligibility because you were already halfway there before you decided that the bear trap was a much better step than the bridge. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. (laughs) I know. Yeah, it's me typing, Abby. I I have a mechanical keyboard for the reason. Yes, he he um, has he has the mechanical keyboard. Yeah, I have a mechanical keyboard because it is it is pleasing to my ears and calming when I'm typing angry emails. Yes. Uh, if so, I could make the ding of the typewriter at the end, I would. Yes, yes, yes. So after what went down yesterday, now that you've had the chance to. Uh, to kind of let it sink in, and, and, and in hour number one, we did play both versions of both goal calls with uh, oh, stupid game. Pangelosi and Higginbotham on one side, and Mike and Jason on the other. Now that you've had the chance to kind of let it ruminate, what else is going in your mind after yesterday? What a stupid game! That is um, true. absolutely true. I like Gonzalo, Gonzalo Pineda. First of all, y'all, he was not happy. Um, yeah. um, oh, oh, Abby, I've got like. I'll have, to, I'll have to bring it sometime. I have like a little fold out keyboard as well that like folds up to the size of a like like a large cell phone and you just unfold it into like a keyboard that you can Bluetooth and use your phone to type on it if you want to. So you can set your phone up and then use this thing to type. Um, I love that little keyboard. It was cheap. Uh, it's, it probably has has uh, metals in it that are going to kill me in the near future. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Gonzalo Pineda was not uh, was not happy. No, look, the result's fine, and that's why I said yesterday. Like, I don't know who needs to hear this. Sometimes you're going to win games you shouldn't. And sometimes you're going to draw and lose games you shouldn't. Mm-hmm. And yesterday was a game you probably shouldn't have won um, because if Chicago could finish, they're probably walking away with three points. Um, a lot of it is, you know, and Gonzalo Pineda said as much. You know, after the game, that you know, look, Chicago was a better team on the day. With the caveat that uh, some of that is because Atlanta, like, let them be. Yeah. Atlanta just kept. I think impatient was a good word for it. Uh, we heard uh, we heard Michelle Chol, you know, talk about being impatient. And Chicago picked their times to really put you under pressure. Some like sometimes Atlanta would walk it up near the halfway line. And Chicago kind of would dare them to play through it. Yeah, Atlanta would try and split lines with a pass. It wouldn't come off. And look, some of those are like ambitious passes that just didn't come off. Some of them were horrendous. Uh, Andrew Gutman played a couple passes where it it was like watching Bo Nix. <laughs> some of these passes, you're like, wow, that's a great ball. I don't know how he saw that. And some of them, you're like, wow, that's a terrible ball. I don't know what he was looking at. I felt like I was watching Bo Nix play quarterback again uh, at Auburn, not 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 uh, Oregon. He did pretty damn well at Oregon. Um he had some great moments at Auburn. He's just inconsistent. Well, I was going to say, <laughs> Jason. The, Jason uh, is scarred. The well, but the thing is, <laughs> so Ricky is too. Ricky's going to find me. Are we talk? Are we talking freshman Bo Nix, or are we talking like uh, junior Bo Nix before he left to go to Oregon? Like junior Bo Nix, or like he still has like the play, um, like the play against LSU where he ran like back and forth across the field. He ran like eighty yards before throwing a touchdown. It was amazing. He'd also make some really weird throws. The, the Atlanta had some of those yesterday where, like, they, they tried to complete. Yeah, Ricky will. Ricky's going to have me drop a pin. He's going to find me Wednesday night, and it's going to be on site. <laughs> um, they, they, would, they, just, they would get impatient, and they're trying to, like, force the ball through. And then they were just – Chicago just basically dared them. Mm-hmm. And Atlanta got impatient. They'd make a dumb pass, and Chicago would jump on it. And this is the thing is like okay, part of so part of this for me is I feel like Chicago's better than everyone's given them credit for, and not just yesterday. This is the Chicago team had Philadelphia in hell, Rich. Yeah. Uh, you can Rich, you watched them last week. They put Philly in hell for 45 minutes until they made a really stupid mistake, and Philadelphia, being a very good team that they are, despite the slow start to the season, put the foot down, tied that game up, and then it was back and forth. Like this isn't the Chicago of like 2021, 2020, 2019, where it's just been like the Chicago used to make, make Jason angry on site. It was always enjoyable to bring them yeah. up because he hated them because <laughs> they just made bad decisions in their builds and their management and everything. I don't think Chicago is as bad as everyone wants to talk about. I don't know why. I don't know why we do this as, as a fan base. So it was the same thing with goals. 
like when when Atlanta makes something happen, it's always like that's an amazing effort on the offensive side of things. Great job getting that goal. Look at that work. When you give something up, yesterday being the exemption, because my God, what a terrible ball from Franco Ivana. Yeah. Um, we do this thing a lot of times where it's it's never a credit to anyone else. It is a failure upon Atlanta. Right. Um, you give Chicago credit in this because you know Derek Etienne Jr. talked about you know there was there were change you know, Chicago threw wrinkles at him. You know Chicago they they change things up. We do this in American sports all the time. We do this in we do we do this in American football literally all the time where a team will put something on tape and then you go see them and you're wondering, well, you, you watch them play afterward, you're like, well, that wasn't on the tape. Yeah. And sometimes it's something glaringly obvious, sometimes it's little wrinkles, but yeah, teams will change things. Um the most hilarious counterpoint to this is 2019 where Atlanta ended the regular season against New England and then turned around and played New England the next week. Right. And I asked Bruce Arena after that game, hey, did Atlanta do anything different before I could finish it? No. They did exactly <laughs> the same thing and exactly what we knew they were going to do. And he was so pissed off because they still lost. Uh-huh. Because at that point, 2019, Atlanta was humming. Mm-hmm. And um, – and and basically it was like, hey, you know exactly what we're gonna do. We know what we're gonna do, and it's still gonna work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was never not funny. No. Um, but but teams will teams will change things. And I, I think I kind of feel like Chicago's not getting enough credit for being a really solid team um to to, to start the year. And I, I think they're I think they're better and they're getting credit for Ezra Henderson's doing a great job, I think, with that team and like that it would be Chicago as hell to like to decide, like, hey, man, we're just going to get rid of you. Um, it would be Chicago as hell because I really like what he's doing there. And and they, they need to – but they have the same problem, you know, Atlanta has had in the past, uh, especially when they were coming out of, you know, the darkness. Um, and even in the darkness where you're like, you, you need to learn how to win. You need to learn how to finish a game because they have dropped – they dropped – they were just like Atlanta. They – in the last two games before yesterday. The two games before yesterday's game, uh, yeah, Abby, I was in the press area. Um, I'm hard to miss, to be fair. <laughs> um, there's no one my size. <laughs> no, that is true. <laughs> we don't have anyone my size. I snuck up on Doug, and it scared him, and it was amazing. Um, I don't know how I did that. But uh, but Chicago had dropped four points in the last two games before yesterday, and then they dropped a point yesterday. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'll then you know you ask them, they'll probably feel like they dropped three points yesterday because they couldn't finish. They get into good positions. Um, my favorite one being in the second half where I forget who it was, might've been, uh, Air Bears, uh, uh, who gets the ball at the penalty spot and hits a shot from the spot that almost goes out for a throw in. Like it was kind of like, uh, when you go golfing and you think everything I'm hitting is slicing to the right. So I'm going to hit it to the left and it's going to slice to the right. He hit it hard to the left and went straight as an arrow. The most perfect straight line shot you've ever seen in your life. Damn thing, damn thing, almost went out for a for a throw in. Um, they're gonna feel like they left points on the board because so yeah, Atlanta didn't play well. I thought Chicago was fine. They came in with the game plan. They came in and brought pressure. Good on them for it. Like we're so used to teams not in the past not coming in and challenging Atlanta, and they they did, and they dared Atlanta, and they dared Atlanta to play through them. Atlanta got impatient. Atlanta would make mistakes. Chicago would jump on them and not capitalize on them. Um, I thought the game was sloppy, but like I said, sometimes you're gonna. You, I, Atlanta was a better team in Toronto. They should have won in Toronto. They shouldn't have won yesterday. Kind of evens out, you know. Yeah, it does. It's 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 really dumb, and you can have mixed emotions about it for sure. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with having mixed emotions about it, where you might feel like, um. You might feel like after the Toronto game, you're feeling frustrated because you felt like you should have won it because you gave up a goal with the death. Yesterday, you're feeling frustrated because even though you won it, you felt like you didn't deserve it. And both of those are incredibly legitimate feelings that no one should make you feel bad for. Um, as long as you, like, and, and I don't want anyone to feel bad for feeling that way. Um, just I, I just want to drive home. It's the sports fan thing of, hey, man, sometimes it's just going to be stupid. Stupid. Sometimes it's not going to make sense. You're going to get things you don't deserve. Then you're going to get things. You're not going to get things you felt like you deserved. Mm-hmm. 
And it's going to come down to individual moments. And in this case, it was the lower back of a Chicago player that proved the distance because I have no idea how much Juan Hoparata actually knew about that ball as it went off of his knee. But as he said afterward, he said the guys, he's talking about Atlanta players, were laughing about the play and about how it went off his knee and then off the guy's back into the goal. He said, I don't care. We won. Uh Um, uh, And that's, hey, man, that's all they care about Um, because – well, I've never caught a seagull on a beach. Jesus, what? <laughs> <laughs> anything Will can sneak up on deserves anything that energy from Jerry. Yeah, yeah. I, basically, if I sneak up on you, you deserve it. That That is natural selection making a decision. I'm not about to cap anybody. I'm not about to take anybody out with a rear naked choke unless it's the MLS Cup and that's sure. gone. Exactly, that's yes. Um, but, yeah, I'm, but if I sneak up on you, that's natural selection sending you a warning. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's just, it's, you, you find, you find a way and you, I think, I think talking to the guys afterward in the locker room, like the mood was, the music was loud, but the mood is kind of weird. Like, I think they're, they're, they're happy to have won, but they know it has to be better. Um, uh, a couple of you, I know, um, I know Tom's talking about uh, Etienne being a disappointment overall. Like it hasn't clicked. Um, he hasn't been the guy that we've seen in Columbus or New York that you were expecting to get. And yeah, I don't know what it is. Um, I don't know if it's styles make fights and he's, he's been in weird styles. Cause like, do you, do you just need, does he need out? Does he need like a, um, does he need like a Charlotte kind of game? Like, uh, like Caleb Wiley got like a get right game. Does he, does he need himself a Savannah state game? <laughs> I don't know. Um, because yeah, it was yeah, and a lot of yesterday was just so uh, kind of weird. Like Ezra Hendrickson talked about, like the way they kind of wanted to bottle up uh, Almada. Almada and kind of force him to one side and kind of pin him down and take him away from things. And then you know the one time they didn't is the one time that during Shakiri's just kind of like, yeah, defense is defense is a construct that I don't necessarily ascribe to. And then Tiago Almada hits a ball that maybe one other guy in the league can hit. And triggers a goal because Yakumakis uh, just kind of keeps being in the right play at the right 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 place at the right time. Um, it, it's 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 yeah, it's it's really weird, man. Um, I I don't know what it is right now. It's bad on both wings because um, you know Four Card talks about Luis because uh, I feel like I'm going insane, and I'm I'm kind of like getting that. Um, I feel like it's like a Berenstein Bears effect where I know Luis Arujo has ha- has talent. Mm-hmm. I've seen it before. I've seen him do some pretty cool things. I don't know where it is. It's somewhere. It just might not be here right now. Yeah. Um, but it, it's tough when you're not getting the productivity out of both wing players. Um, it was It was... It's just weird, man. Like it's weird that because because one of them, you know, you know, one of them is a is an MLS guy who's produced where he's been. And look, even if things aren't going great, I want Derek Etienne on this team because of his energy, because of what he brings to that locker room. Yep. Um, he's a very positive energy guy. He is a guy I would always want in my roster because of the way he helps the culture and the energy. Um, Luis has talent, and we've seen it. But it ain't showing right now, and it's it is. It, I mean, you're, you're beyond worried. It's beyond worrying at this point. Like you're you're past that. He showed out in preseason, and just I mean, he's got. Well, I think he has two goals this year. Yep. Um. It just hasn't it hasn't he hasn't translated to the game to where it can impact games consistently. That's frustrating. I don't I don't know because because I don't know how they. Um, I don't know. I don't know how they're going to, I don't know. I don't know how you kickstart him. You know, I don't know the answer to that. Well, but the, the other element in it though, is that if you're not seeing the ball go in the back of the net from Luis, you are also seeing him coming back and working his ass off defensively. Right? You are, but you do need more than that. And, oh, he, I, all, I, and I, 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 he, I will never question that man's effort. Um, I will never question how hard he works. Because he, he 
bust his ass. So one of the things that I love the most about him and all this frustration is I asked Gonzalo Pineda about this last night, about the way they dealt with set pieces has been really good this year, especially recycled set pieces in that second ball. So often when they clear a ball, if they don't trigger a break and it's in the other team keeps it in the attacking half, Luis is one of the first guys out there closing down. He absolutely does the little things on the defensive side really well, but you're not paying him just for that. And you're paying him to have moments where he's able to take over. And he hasn't been able to do it. I will never question that man's effort. And it, you know it eats him up inside. He's a professional athlete. He has a lot of pressure. He he knows that number on his salary. Mm-hmm. Um, it's It's got to be eating him up. And it sucks. Um, you know, Byrne talked about, you know, Garth wanting to uh, deal with dead money. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I don't know if you buy out Arujo. But if the summer comes and you get another offer from Brazil, yeah, yeah, I mean, you might, you, you, it might have been a, I don't know if we want to, I don't know if they looked at it in January and I don't know how serious it was because again, I don't, we don't know our Brazilian sources as well as we know our sources in Argentina. I don't know if it was how, how legitimate the rumors were, right? But if Atlanta said, we want to, you know, because he talked at the end of last season you know, about being motivated to come in and make a point this year. Um, if he gets to summer and he hasn't, you know, turned it over, you know, do you just kind of punt on and say, look, we're just, you know, we, we need to go our separate ways. Where yeah. do you, you, you want to, do you want to go home and we'll make it happen? You know, let's just, let's just end it. Um, yeah. Because yeah, he's, it's like I said, it's frustrating because he's talented, and it, but, and it hasn't, it hasn't come to fruition in 2023 when, he didn't have the injury like he did at the beginning of 22. And now you're just wondering, well, damn, what do, what do you do? What do, you do? do you go out? Do you, do you move him and go out and get somebody? The summer window could be really, really busy for Atlanta. Aside from that, because, you know, Doug Almada's probably going to be gone. Now, you know, however that works it remains to be seen. So, so you're saying life's going to be busy for Atlanta, yeah, I mean, Atlanta United. Well, and that's the thing, uh, to Burns' point, is, you know, I don't, you know, if you get him, you could, if you sell him to somebody, it might be on it, you might, you might take a bath on it. Yeah. And you might sell him somewhere uh, down in Brazil or, you know, send him out alone just to, to get him to, to find a way to do what you can to, to, you know, massage the numbers to, to get it going. Because if he's but, not getting it going, if he's not going to get it going here. Yeah. I don't. I don't know that you move him, but maybe you're listening in the summer. I don't know. Well, and, and obviously, you never, you never want to for a double negative. You never want to not listen. I mean, if yeah. someone, if someone is interested, then for you to listen, it, it's as a business, is as a business entity. You know, somebody comes knocking on your door. Hey, you know, I got a question for you. You're not going to sit there and not answer your door. And it, it will be, it'll be interesting on a bunch of different fronts. I think for Atlanta United in the summer. And remember that you, with all of the, all of the financials, it, it don't take it as one transaction at a time. Think of it collectively as to how uh, Atlanta United is doing in a, in a business sense. I know that we are locked into individual transactions with individual players, but I, I think it's safe to say that Atlanta United wants to be one of those grandes. And they are they are acting as such and they are spending as such and they're not afraid to spend as such because they understand what it takes to to be that grande. So take all of the spending on the whole. Don't look at individual transactions as how things are going for a club when it comes to players incoming, players outgoing, that kind of a thing. And then to Will's point, I mean, this is the thing is late 2021, uh, Luis was go back and look at the DC game in 20, late 2021. I mean, dude was a menace Mm -hmm. in late 2021. He was, he was great. And you're wondering, you know, okay, where is that guy? Yeah. Because you know, he's in there and and to to everybody's point is you, you've seen that he's in there, but it hasn't been coming out. And there's a lot of talent on the field right now. Um, Yakumaki's when he plays, um, you know, he comes from Greece. When he plays, 
He does, in fact, score with ease. <laughs> he scored in five straight starts um, with a possibly damaged hamstring, no less, on the last one. Um, although, you know what? Hey, as long as we're talking about Luis, let's give him credit because uh, he creates that opportunity with speed and dribble in the first half where he hits an outside of the foot little like loop de loop pass mm-hmm. into the path of Yakimakis, who gets fouled at the top of the 18. Now, VAR is not going to go do anything about that because it's outside of the box. They're not going to re-referee the game, and they're not going to go back and give a foul in a dangerous free kick position. It was absolutely a foul. Oh, absolutely. It's shoulder to back. Mm-hmm. I don't know why you don't call it there unless Yakumakis has turned into Cam Newton where we've decided that uh, we're not going to call foul call fouls on him because he's a big guy and we're overestimating you know, uh-huh. physical contact or something. It's absolutely a foul. I don't know why it wasn't called. Um, I mean, Fabian Herbers for me, I don't know why he didn't get either carded or sent out. And the same for Seahost because when was it Seahost that laid into Seahost uh, is the one who did both of them. Yeah, Seahost okay. is the one that elbowed Yakumakis in the head. Yes, and that didn't um, fall. And, and he and he's the one who you know sho- who like put a shoulder into the back at the top of the eighteen. Now I thought, okay, I thought VAR handled that perfectly because I, I disagree with the call in the field. They went and looked at it. What they're looking at to see is to see if that contact was in the box because I very much wonder if he had trucked Yakumakis in the box. It's going to the. It's going to go to VAR. I think it's a penalty at that point. Uh huh. But because it happened in the D, and it didn't happen inside the eighteen yard box, you're not re-referring that moment because that's not how VAR works in this league. That's mm-hmm. not how VAR works at all. Um, so what you're left with is a situation where they can look back on it and go, "Hey man, <laughs> you missed that call. <laughs> Nothing we can do about it now, but you yeah. missed that call." Still unsure how they didn't do anything with the one where he led with the elbow into the side of Yakubakis' head. Like, he didn't swing the elbow, but he certainly led with it when he jumped. It was a forearm shiver. Yeah, it was, it was something. Uh-huh. And I mean, that's, you know, that's a word to use. But, yeah, for me, there were some elements in there. Again, it's Cam Newton-esque, like, where we're just – um. Is Cam Newton asked where we're just like, are we just gonna like let him get beat up because he's a big guy? Hmm. Yeah, I mean that's that might be part of it, but yeah, I mean how how you get a forearm shiver into the side of somebody's face, and, and you don't get a call, you don't get a you don't get a call much less a card, and, and yeah, it, it I mean it was the only thing missing. Will was the shattering of the announce table. I mean literally it was it was Undertaker tossing Mick Foley off the top of Hell in a Cell. I mean, yeah, it's it's. I was careful with the hyperbole, but I mean, it's it's an elbow to the side of the head. Um, it was it was it was annoying, but I thought Var did most of the things right. Um, but ultimately, like that's and that's and it's an interesting one because if you call that, it might be a red penalty. Yeah, <laughs> and then the game is possibly two nothing. And you're probably done at that point. Yeah, um, I mean, so you still feel like you're escaping because after the goal that Atlanta scores early in the game, it feels like um, it feels like it feels like Chicago just got comfortable and was like, "Cool, we're gonna press you at times. When you get to a certain point, we have a line of confrontation. Then when you start pushing forward." And you back pass, then we're going to drop it where we're going to push on that back pass and try and close down spaces and jump into lanes. Chicago, I thought, did everything they were, they, I thought they did everything they should have done. Mm-hmm. But I still think that, I still think that the, the forearm clear out was, was, was a card. And I, I still think that the, the, uh, the body check from behind by Seahos on Yakamaki's was, uh, inside the 18. And I thought it was, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was a penalty. I legitimately did. But that's the, the one thing that that gets to me, once again, is the, the iniquity of the calls. And I think that, to your point, and I think that this is something that we've got to keep an eye on. I, I think it's something that we've got to keep an eye on where Yorgis Yakamakis is concerned. 
is it because he is that physical force that he's not getting the calls because and if he go and if he goes down the assumption is oh he went down too easily is that because he is so big that he he is going to have a different set of rules attached to him because of who he is and how he is in a in a physical stature i think it's i think it's good empirical that's a good empirical case study going forward this year especially yeah. after chicago yeah. man yeah, and it'll be interesting to see how he's managed and to see how he manages minutes now because I do not I, I I don't expect him to dress off Saturday for Wednesday. He went off with a hamstring again. Mm-hmm. Um, you're hoping that he didn't make long term damage to it at this point because you know he 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 went off with it last week, came out and played. They uh, Miguel Barry was about to come in anyway. Yeah, um, I had been, I I was I was hoping against hope when he went down and Emilio I think pointed out. Um, and a couple other people that, that he had kind of pulled at that hamstring a time or two before that in the game. Yeah. Leading up to that, I was kind of hoping that he was gamesmanshipping it up a bit and kind of saying, ah, oh no, my hamstring. Yeah. Whatever will I do? Oh dear. Oh me. Oh my. Um, oh, oh no. Oh, what was me? <laughs> uh, get me off the field. No, it actually looked like he heard it, which sucks. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it was not one of those, uh, you know, it was not one of those Sanford and Son, you know, Elizabeth, it's the big one kind of things. And, uh, you know, that th- this is the uh, the other part of it. Yeah, Abby, uh, oh, that's a good question. Uh, is Pro is Pro in charge of Open Cup? Open Cup referee. I have no idea. Ooh, sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, I picked up Bojangles this morning and... I just realized they gave me a couple of uh, hash browns, but I didn't ask for any. It's a good day. See, that is a good day. That is a good day. Cajun filet biscuit with pimento cheese. Yes. It's a good day. These U.S. Open Cup. All right. So we have clicked into the Open Cup element uh, from an article from assignments, uh, other competitions. Let's see if we have other competitions decided as of yet. No, it does not appear that Pro has announced anything going on involving Open Cup. It's going to be like Baltimore, Toledo, and Drew Fisher, and I'm going to be apoplectic. Or it could be um, it could be uh, Sergei Demyanchuk and a lot of other folks that we get to see during Life with the Twos. So, I mean, it, it could be very, very interesting when when we see what the announcements are for uh, for those particular matches, what Dude, the- was amazing because he both refed arguably the worst game I've ever seen last year and one of the best I've ever seen last year. <laughs> that man was nines and ones. Oh man, uh, yeah, uh, and so Burn just looked up uh, Luis's contract and it runs through 2026. But once again, I mean, uh, remember, remember with contracts. What you do with these contracts, I mean, hell, look at Chelsea and with what they've done with folks like Mudrick, signing them to an eight-year deal. It's so you can control the asset. Don't look at the end. Don't look at the length of a contract and get locked into that idea of the contract. Oh, we have him until the year 2230. This isn't like Zager and Evans or anything like that. That's your Google reference for the day, kids. Um Because you have someone under contract through a particular year doesn't mean, A, that you are going to keep them through the end of that contract or something that's or that you're going to have that kind of an outlay for the length of the contract. That is so you can control the asset. This is strictly a business decision. Any player that you feel you look at the length of a contract and you're going, holy bleep, what's that? That is so you can, one, control the asset, and two, mitigate the cap element to, excuse me, to that asset. Instead of, say, you've got to say, all right, so it's a, so it's a five-year deal. Let's let's just say it's a five-year deal for the sake of math. If you have invested fifteen million dollars in a player, salary, everything, fifteen million over five years. That's a lot better than fifteen million over three, because of how that impacts your bottom line. That impacts all of your salary numbers. That impacts everything heading up against your cap. So it is controlling the asset 
and it is controlling your yearly hit. Think of it like the National Football League. So don't look at don't look at a contract with a player that you might not be a hundred percent on and sit there and go, man, we're stuck with this guy until the end of that deal. No, it is to control the asset. So if something happens and you have a conversation with a club and the player can be moved or wants to be moved or what have you, you have control of the asset. You're not sitting there and going in the last six months of a deal and all of your uh, amortization and everything, it's already all behind you and the player can walk. That's the last thing you want. And unless you're DC United, did I say that out loud? Um, Maybe. See Bill. Hey, DC won this weekend because Orlando is Orlando is quietly carrying a torch for one of the more disappointing teams in the league this year. Mm -hmm. They're not the worst team in the league, but with what Orlando spent in the offseason, um, and what we thought they were going to be, they're just kind of mid. Yeah. So. And Emilio, to your to your uh, to your question, uh, what are the the ways out? I mean, they are By it is, yeah. It, it is the the burn, burn point. You can, yeah, it's what, you, what you did with Jurgen Dom last year. Yeah, uh, you get one a year, um, and that is and look, if it comes down to that, they're going to pursue every avenue that they have before they buy him out. They're going to like if they can sell him. Mm -hmm. for pennies on the dollar they'll do it it's the same thing with Jurgen Dom like they didn't buy him out last year until they had exhausted every avenue of trying to unload him somewhere else like if 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 it gets down to that and I'm not saying it will yeah I don't know um if it gets down to it they will uh you know they'll, they'll they'll and they decide they want to move on he decides he wants to move on everybody needs a fresh start They'll try everything they can to find him a move before they use that buyout. That is a that is a last ditch decision. Yeah. So that's what that's what you're staring at. Uh, Just so we're clear. Yeah. Burns says contract means you still have to pay him through 26. If he goes somewhere else where he gets paid less than your buyout payment, then we'll have to make up the difference. And yeah, and it still does affect your cap unless the player is 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 bought out entirely so and then you have the the one-off and things like that uh you you do have the get out of jail free card and yeah. that that's the that's the one that's just like yep once once a year and you're just kind of like yeah okay fine but yeah just look at look at contract length and look at contract number and it's a way to to budget out the damage uh, of a of a yearly cap hit so think think of it that way like we see in other leagues with the national football league uh Tafka, that is a rules question. How if he's a DP is a contract hit at a set six hundred twenty-five thousand dollars? That is a question for New York and all of their uh business folk. No, the Tafka does have a trivia question. How many keepers has Atlanta United capped with at least one first team league and match? I have the answer waiting for the end of the show today. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's uh that's crazy. It's I mean, crazy considering the fact that you had um, it, it's it's crazy because in the sense that you had, uh, you had Alcan for the first part of the season one. Then it's been Brad Guzan every year since then. Yeah, except when and he's, except when he's been injured. Except when he's been injured the last two years, or he got called into national team duty. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's it is it is uh. It is wild how many they've had to roster and get minutes to. Um, uh -huh. Going back to the Kyle Rangers days, now Alex Tembach is having to play because Kyle Rangers got sent off. Yep. Uh, never forget, all happened because the U.S. called Brad Gazan in for national team games, then chose to play an old Tim Howard instead of him. Uh huh. Um, and Alec Can was hurt. It, by the way, it was a FIFA window, so Atlanta couldn't say no. Um, and uh, then, yeah, Kyle Rangers. It commits a red card offense, and you had to play Alex Tambacca. So you went through all four keepers in the span of like five days. That was amazing. I don't recommend it. No, no, no. Uh, yeah. So, all right. So here, here's 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 your list. We'll go backwards. We'll, we'll go backward and have fun with this. Uh, this season, it's Brad, it's uh, Westberg, and it's Clem on Job. Those three. Those three. Those three have gone this year. Last year, it was Brad, it was Bobby, 
it was Rocco, and it was Raul Gudinho. Rocco had the most apps. He had 16 appearances, seven appearances each for Brad Bo- and Bobby, and Raul Gudinho had six. Uh, Brad, yeah, had- last year was yeah, last year was Grim on the keeper front man. Yes, four separate keepers: Rocco, Brad, Bobby, and Raul Gudinho. And that's the thing is, like Bobby Gloves was, Bobby Gloves was a good goalkeeper for a long time. He just hit that cliff that we talk about, and he hit that cliff at possibly the worst time imaginable to hit a cliff like that, mm-hmm. because it was, hey man, Brad just blew out his Achilles. We need you to play. Yeah, and he just wasn't the same guy he had been in years past because <clears throat> uh, Bobby Sheldonsworth had been a very serviceable goalkeeper for over a decade in this league uh, had given you basically what you expected out of what you've gotten out of Westberg so far, mm-hmm. what you're getting out of uh, Clementio. Uh, that's what you expected to get. Out of him, and then he just didn't have it at that point. Uh, and then, you know, Rocco was, eh, although Rocco's uh, Rocco's playing his trade in USL now, by the way, for those of you that don't know, he's out in, uh, I believe Phoenix. He's in Phoenix with, with uh, Jacko. Yeah. He's in Phoenix with Jackson Conway. Um, and then I think his, you know, it for it was kind of inconsistent, kind of. Um, and then I think his confidence got obliterated in the Philadelphia game where he just had an awful game. Man, last year was grim. All right, keep going. Uh, then we had uh, it was calmed where it was Brad and Alec, or it was Brad. And going back to seventeen eighteen, it was Brad, except for one from Alec Can, and then the other one. Paul, the Paul Christensen. Paul the Wall. 55 minutes in a match. Who I believe just retired and, last year. Yeah. So you had Paul the Wall for two for a match. And then in season number one, you mentioned Alex Tambakis, who has made a lifetime for himself. Alex Tambakis is a legend in USL, man. Yeah, he's in New I think he's in New Mexico as a legend there. Was he in Greenville for a minute? Uh, I think he was. Effort in, let's, let's see. Or North Carolina. Carolina. He was he was he, the North Carolina. That much I do. But yeah, Alec Can, Brad Gazan, Kyle Rainish, Alex Tambakis. So those are your ten. I, this, and this, again, Yuri Shakimakis is the second Greek player for Atlanta United. Yeah. <laughs> because um Alex Tambakis was the first ever signing for Atlanta United and the first Greek signing for Atlanta United. Yeah. He also, uh, by the way, um, played at VV Vivenlo. Yeah. So VV Vivenlo is the unintentional breeding ground for Atlanta United talent. Yep. So Atlanta, Charleston Battery, Sporting, North Carolina FC, New Mexico United, and he's been with New Mexico United for for a while. So yeah, the, that, that stretch for North Carolina was really good though. Um, eighteen through twenty. Yep. So <sighs> ten. Man. Ten. I feel. I feel like Ty Dillinger. Ten. Ten keepers in the uh, yeah, ten keepers in the history of this club. When it when it's when it's one, you know that the club's doing well. When it's two, you know that the number one is out on international team duty. When it's four in a season, that's a bit much. Yes, y'all. There was a Greek player for Chicago as well. The Greek invasion has uh, usurped the Scottish invasion. I am, I am, I'm distraught. So, uh, uh, so that's what you know. Ten keepers, ten keepers. Uh, did Chicago have a Greek player come in in the second half? Yeah. Forget his name. He's, he's another Yorgos. Uh, yeah. Hang on just a second. Let me get to uh, the substitution pattern here for the match, and I will tell you who it was. And good for you. Yeah, and Tim Bach is just having a really good little career for himself. Yeah. It's the same uh, thing we oh. talk about all the time with some of these kids, though, that come out of Atlanta United system. Like, yeah, uh, you know, they're not all they're not all going to play first team MLS minutes, but like all the wrong kiss you do, you know, applying his trade at Memphis, who won over the weekend. Um, yeah, strange how that but, happens when you give a, a coach patience. Uh, I mean, well, it's and it's it's a system. I mean, it's 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 a change from what you know Pierman was doing in Memphis when he goes to Charleston. You know, it's 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 a new install. Um, Sometimes it gets a little weird. And they played some weird games. Yesterday was the first, like, straightforward, comfortable win that Memphis has had. They've, they've played in some very weird games so far this year. But uh, guys like Laurent Kissy do, you know, mm-hmm. might not be a first-team MLS guy. No. He's still, you know, able to have a career 
doing something he loves for a living, which is a life that many of us can aspire to. Yeah. Uh, Abby, you were thinking of uh, Yorgios Kutsius, the 19-year-old forward who came in and played 20 minutes for Chicago. So that was that was who, that was who you were looking at. Uh, no, Michael Valverde, you have not missed the Wrexham chat. You have not missed the Wrexham chat. And I did see uh, Abby at the tailgate wearing her Wrexham shirt, by the way. And uh, Wrexham, I, and like I said, I was listening to BBC Radio Wales. And I was listening to the end of that match. And then when BT Sport would post the videos of, you know, after the fact and all that kind of stuff to see what has happened there where you had, I think it was what in, in, they had the, the fans had to raise like, they raised like six figures in seven hours to keep the club from being dissolved completely. And then you have Ryan and Rob come in who I think paid two and a half million to buy the club and they've, I mean, there's a great article in the athletic that drop that goes through what happened at the end of last season and them going out in the playoffs and getting ready for this season and doing what they did in the national league. And a lot of folks are maintaining that what happened this season in the national league will never happen again because you had Wrexham and you had Knotts County, both over 100 points. And only Wrexham, because they won the National League, is going to get automatically promoted. Literally, the, it is uh, in the in the National League in and of itself. You had them, and uh, where are my leagues here? Leagues and cups. Okay, so your leagues, domestic. Well. That's not really what I was looking for, but okay, great. You don't go to the National League, so we'll have to go this way. Uh, the National League in and of itself has uh, a bit of an odd structure for promotion. And you had Wrexham at 110 points, Knotts County at 106, and this is with one match to go. So Wrexham. They're clear. Knotts County looks like they're going to host. They're going to wait. They, they and Chesterfield get a first round by. The problem is, and this was brought up by Ryan Reynolds, that Wrexham and Knotts County are so far and away ahead of everybody else. Chesterfield is third with 81 points, 25 points behind Knotts County. But because of the way the structure is, it is seven teams or six, two, three, uh, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, they get to figure out the next two spots to go into League Two. They're trying to change that because of Knotts County being so far and away better than three through seven that something ought to change in that regard. So we'll see if the, the promotion element changes in the National League. But, yeah, I mean, 81, 79, 74, 70, and 69 with a match to go, and Borum Wood has two matches to go. So... I mean, you're looking at what we saw with Wrexham, and they are, uh, I think they're operating at a three million pound loss this year, but I think that since Ryan Reynolds sold Mint Mobile, it's not anything that he really has to worry about. Um, then, well, and, and Rich, Rich is asking, do we bring up the Euro snobs loving Wrexham one only after discovering Rob and Ryan bought it and two choosing that and still not watching MLS. And I mean, frankly, I mean, it is, it is a natural drawing card Jarrett for, you know, Wrexham because of Rob and Ryan and the TV series. It is a natural drawing card because, uh, Hey, you have owners that are, that are, stars of TV and movies, and they decided to create a, a TV series. But they found out once they bought the club that it means just a lot more than buying a club. And I think that if you watch the series, you will realize that the light came on for them. And Rob McElhenney specifically has said that it is a part, it is a part of his, you know, it, it's a part of his family now. It's a part of his you know, family's DNA. The, the association that, that he has with this club and this town. So, you know, I think it was a, it was a wake up call for the two of them about what it means in these communities. And, and, you know, Rich, honestly, if you want, if you want to, uh, 
you know, not watch MLS and you just want to watch Ryan and Rob, you know, that's on you. Uh, just look, if, if folks want to just do that, then let them do that. Yeah, you know, then they can sit there and say, I'm, I'm a Wrexham fan. Well, why? Well, because of what I saw with Welcome to Wrexham. And you hope that they can learn from that experience and not just sit there and go, uh, okay, well, you're a fan. Hopefully that it sticks with you and that you learn about what it means to not just that town, but that team. And yeah, and that's the thing. I, Michael, I'm right there with you. I mean, yeah, Abby, one of them purchased a house in Wrexham. And Michael, I can watch. Michael says he can watch both MLS and Wrexham and EPL and the league. Yeah, I mean, I'm watching the Honduran league on Fox Deportes and not flinching about it. It's just it's if it's if it's what you're up to and if you dig it, then watch it and share it with everybody else. You know, if you're if you're in Wrexham just because of the TV series, hopefully that you will learn more about what that town that that team means to that town and what Ryan and Rob. And the other investors have been able to give back to that town. There are deeper stories that are attached to it sometimes. There uh, are. Yeah. And it's, I, what always gets me um, the most upset, the most annoyed, honestly, is this whole thing where everybody has decided it has to be one thing or the other. You know, mm-hmm. um, like you can only support, you know, you can only support MLS or you can only support, you know, you know, the national league, like, no, it doesn't have to be that thing. We don't, again, we talked about this before. You don't have to trash something. It's the same thing. I tell my daughter about, you know, food and it, it's embarrassing that we have to have, keep having the same conversation I have with my child. You don't, you don't yuck if somebody else's yuck. Mm-hmm. If somebody enjoys something, let them enjoy it. Yep. If you don't enjoy it, keep your damn mouth shut. Who gives a damn? Mm-hmm. If you like MLS, great. If you like the Hunter and Lee, great. If you like the National League, great. I'm a sicko and I watch Scotland all the time. Mm-hmm. Great. It's fun. It's stupid. It's beautiful. It's sport. It makes you happy. Who cares? Don't be that person standing over somebody else screaming at them and telling them not to enjoy something for whatever damn reason or getting mad at them for enjoying it. It's just it's such a childish bunch of BS Mm -hmm. from people who I man, I don't know what the hell everyone's problem is about this. You don't have to equate this whole thing of, oh well, we're watching Wrexham and this is this is the real game. MLS is MLS is nothing compared to this, or I can't believe you'd watch that when MLS is right here. That's just trash compared to what's going on. Quit equating, quit, quit deciding that just because something is good, something else in turn has to be bad, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Just I'm sick of it. And I'm sick of people trying to cloud chase on all this crap. And I'm just exhausted by it. It's the same thing with like, with, with dealing with any sport where like, God knows I can't, God knows it gives me a migraine whenever the Braves go on a losing streak. Because 162 game schedule, a team blows, you know, a team has a lead three times in the weekend and loses all three games. Well, shit happens, I guess. Um, and then everyone loses their mind about stuff. I'm like, I this this isn't this isn't football, American football where there's 17 games. Things are kind of stretched out. You're playing the long game in, in soccer as well. And I know it's 30 something games for most leagues. I think the National League's playing like 40 something. They're yeah, insane. 46. Um, yeah. Again, they are insane. That doesn't include <laughs> you know the the you know that doesn't include you know the cups over there, the FA Cup. No, and I'm sure lower cups that I don't remember off the top of my head. We got gummy bear and we got uh, Johnston's paint for the lower divisions and all those. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, you, it's just, it's just so exhausting. This, this whole thing where everybody chooses to be miserable. Not everybody. People choose to be miserable Mm -hmm. and it's not enough to choose to be miserable. You make it your life's goal to make other people miserable with you. Get the hell on. Yeah. It's like the old Calvin and Hobbes cartoon where Calvin is in a really bad mood and he's just, you know, crabby towards Sally and Sally gets in a bad mood because she's around Calvin who's in a bad mood. And then the final frame is uh, Calvin with the grin on his face saying there's nothing better than, you know, sharing your, your bad mood with other folks. It's something like that. I'm paraphrasing. And, and Jason's right. Like Too many ML, MLS fans are mad at the Wrexham story. It's irrational. If you if you're like hardcore to MLS and you're mad at Rex, I, I can't help you. 
Why are you mad? Mm-hmm. It doesn't impact you. Wrexham, like, first of all, ESPN gives two dams about MLS, and one of those dams left town. They yep. don't care. They've made that clear. It's fine. Get over it. Just ignore them. Who gives a damn yeah. what, it, what ESPN thinks at this point? Because they're not doing anything with MLS. Mm-hmm. They're not doing anything with Open Cup. Who cares? Not your problem anymore. Yep. You're not losing sleep on it. You're not losing money on it at this point if you're a fan. Find, find your sources. And speaking of Open Cup... And places where you can keep an eye on it. CBS Sports Golasso Network will stream the Open Cup third round match between Charlotte and South Georgia Tormenta live on Tuesday. Bolt up. Uh, the network uh, is available free on CBSSports.com, the app, and Pluto, as well as Paramount Plus. Uh, 7.30 Eastern Kick is going to kick off their live match coverage of the tournament. And so Tormenta and Charlotte is going to inaugurate CBS Sports Golazo Network's coverage. In addition, they'll be the uh, Tormenta will be the only Division Three team streamed on the network in the third round of the competition. Uh, you've also got uh, the Miami FC going up against Inter Miami on 7:30. Third match of the round on Golazo Network is Portland Timbers in Orange County Wednesday at 10:30. In addition to live match coverage, Golazo is going to provide in-depth analysis of the Open Cup across their live studio platforms, morning footy, box-to-box, provide additional editorial coverage. So CBS Sports Golasso Network is showing Tormenta and Charlotte as a part of their increased coverage of the United States tournament. So there you go. Cool. I'm happy about it. Uh, I'm also still really pissed off right now because now I'm – like kind of revved up about this whole Rexon thing in MLS because I we've had this discussion multiple times in the last calendar year and I'm really tired of having it and I'm really tired that it keeps coming up and that people still want to like people still want to get on the damn godforsaken bird app and do look at me nonsense while complaining about you know Rexham or about MLS or about you know insert league here or yeah. about coverage from here or whatever we live in an amazing time. I don't know how many of y'all remember 10 years ago when it was a minor miracle to watch something other than the EPL or Champions League on TV. Mm-hmm. You can stream damn near anything. Um, you know, and, and some of the soccer stream sites have died an ignoble death, unfortunately, as sketchy as they were. You can find a lot of stuff to watch. It's a good time to be alive and be a soccer fan because you can you can keep up keep up with stuff. You can you can see what's going on, you can get the background stories, and you don't you don't have to always celebrate everything. And I get it. Like if you don't care about like Wrexham hasn't really impacted me. I think it's a really cool story. Um, I think it's fascinating the way that these guys bought into it and then you know, really like just leaned all the way into the community on it. I think it's an awesome story. Um, and I think it's, I think their reactions to, to their ability to go up is absolutely worth talking about. And I think it's, I think it's awesome for the people. It's, yeah. it, it hasn't moved the needle for me personally, and that's fine. Like I just I mainly mean, mainly because I don't have the bandwidth right now um, to keep up with everything they do. Mm-hmm. That's fine. I'm happy for anyone who does, but you don't have to go out of your way to tell people they're being dumb, yeah, or to tell people that it's a waste of their time. Like don't don't tell people how to spend their time. Yeah, don't te- don't tell people what to enjoy. Just I don't know. Try shutting up. Yeah. It costs you nothing to be quiet. Yeah. Uh, it costs you nothing to sit there and lose your mind over your own team. I had enough problems as a sports fan watching Atlanta sports without getting into like the problems of Wrexham. Yeah. Well, and uh, by the way, this is a happy transfer deadline day in Major League Soccer for all those who celebrate. So. It, it's the transfer deadline day. ML- but- Atlanta United's on their third keeper. Uh, their starting striker may have blown his hamstring out again. The Atlanta Hawks' second best player in the playoffs bumped a ref last night and might not play in game five, which is the most accurate ending to this season with a gentleman sweep humanly possible. Um, let's see. The Atlanta Falcons, I don't know what they're going to do in the draft. 
the Braves bullpen had a hiccup this week, but otherwise they've been fine. And they're threatening to build a stadium off freaking Windward and McFarland to house a hockey team, even though they have no guarantee that said hockey team would actually come or play there. Correct. And it, I got enough problems in this city alone <laughs> with sports. Oh, and the Atlanta Dream are in kind of a quasi like reload again. Yes. Um, I got enough problems in sports without worry, without like telling people not to worry about or to worry more about something with Wrexham. Yeah. Uh, and, Go enjoy it or don't. I don't yes. care. Yes. And, and live your life. Yes. Anyway. And, and uh, one other thing. I don't know if you saw this. This came from the four letter paper. Uh, Arsenal's women's team plane was struck by a bird and caught fire on the runway as they were trying to leave Germany, literally as they were taxiing and taking off bird strike in the left engine. What kind of bird? A condor? Probably. Uh, Burst into flames on the runway. Incident occurred at the Wolfsburg airport. Flew into the engine shortly before it was due to take off. Flames immediately started to come out of the left engine of the 737. Pilots evacuated the passengers. Arsenal's first team squad on uh, all safety. Uh, So they stayed an extra night in Germany and uh, hooked up with the same airline to uh, come back the next day. Team used a Maltese airline to fly to Germany on Saturday due to fly back, but forced to switch to a replacement airline. And so they've got that to uh, following their return from Germany. Arsenal can look forward to trying to seal their place in the Champions League final after fighting back to earn a 2-2 draw in the first leg. So I'm walking back. If a bird strikes the engine, we're on the runway and catches fire. That's an omen. Mm -hmm. I'm walking. Yes. So, but like I said, that came from the, that came from the four letter paper overseas. So we'll uh, we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, Germany to London's a hike, but yes. look, if the Romans could do it, I you, I could do it. Yes. Um, also, let's see. I'm trying to do stuff before we go. Uh, <laughs> oh man, Charlotte FC won't be making another bid to sign Irish midfielder. Uh, Jack Byrne from Shamrock Rovers. Shamrock rejected numerous bids, according to Tom Bogert. Yeah, Byrne on rejected bids. It is what it is. I wonder if he desperately wanted to come, and they said, no, we're going to run down your contract. Yeah. I wonder if he goes on a free, though. Yeah, that could be. That could be very well. Uh, Byrne. MLS has a per- uh, very uninformed opinion. Burn has Burn says MLS has a perception problem. Goes back to a time when the quality wasn't really that good. And remember, also, this is a league that's only twenty six years old. So, I, folks, remember that stuff. Yeah, and and I get what MLS is doing with the new setup um, with with Apple TV. Like it is kind of that NFL model. Everything kicks off, you know, local times around the same time. It's not as strict as the NFL, where you have the one o'clock window and then the four o'clock window. Um, but you, you know, you have your kickoffs at specific times, then it's almost like having a game of the week, um, you know, for, for, for the Sunday afternoon game, which is cool. Mm -hmm. I I, I guess I get it. I just, there's, there's times where I really like it and times where I miss, you know, to Burns point where, you know, you, you really saw more mix up. I'd love to see them get a, get a, you want to keep that. That's fine. But at a game Saturday at noon. Or Saturday at one, and you want to pick and choose it. Cool, like you want it to be in, you know, San Jose at noon on a Saturday, or, um, you know, it, well, I say San Jose because it's you know it's not as cripplingly hot as Miami, yeah. Well, but are you saying a nine a.m. kick at PayPal Park? Well, okay, maybe not. Maybe San Jose is a bad example then. Um, you know, but pick pick somewhere where you know it's not a hundred thousand degrees, and kick them off at one p.m. Uh, yeah, San Jose is a bad example. You're right. Time, time zones, which is part of Burns' point. <laughs> um, but you know, figure out, you know, you'll figure out how to how to extend this out because I don't hate the model as it works now, but I think it can be improved. You know, you know, add a Saturday afternoon game, add a one o'clock game, add a four o'clock game, then add, then have your games at seven, you know, eight, nine. Add your have your Sunday game as well, but like, and you can just be like one game at one. One game at four, so have that have that San Jose game be at four o'clock, so it's one p.m. local time. Yeah, that way when people are getting done with their EPL in the morning or whatever degenerative league they want, <laughs> they have the opportunity to just roll right into MLS. Especially during this time where look, you're going to have NBA playoffs. It's going to be happening mostly at night. Yeah, you're going to have NHL playoffs, which happen mostly at night. Uh, you know, go ahead and 
go ahead and, and, and approach it from that perspective as opposed you know to to going to going toe to toe there and if you need to adjust it in the fall fine when when, when college football starts is what it is but especially during the summer months you know mm-hmm. you know have that opportunity where it's you know a game at one a game at four rest of your game seven eight nine and then maybe your sunday game that's kind of your your fun game uh also i you know, we've, i've begged this for a while i know others have as well i'm not the first one on this um i'm begging you mls friday nights oh just eight o'clock, seven thirty, whatever you got to do. Just one game on a Friday night. It's just, there. Just do it. it. It's there for you. Just wait for it. you. Look, if, look. If the ACC can monopolize Thursday nights in the fall, you can at least try to monopolize Friday night. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, you could do that. You could have you could have Friday night football all to yourself. Mm-hmm. Friday night football all to yourself. Yeah. And. Uh, We've we've gone we have blown past yeah the, I know the two Which hour is fine because I'm about done anyway okay well we got more stuff to talk about tomorrow we got uh we got Wrexham to talk about tomorrow we got Spurs to talk about tomorrow we have this new league that has popped up that we could talk about tomorrow this new gathering and this new gaggle of folks uh, the Union of European Clubs football clubs of all sizes deserve a voice so the Union of European Clubs which has their own Twitter now, by the way. And uh, learn more about the UEC and launch event this afternoon. So an independent representative body founded to improve support and advocacy for non-elite professional football clubs across Europe. All professional clubs belong to the uniforming football ecosystem should have a meaningful voice and effective representation in designing the rules that govern them, access to professional services, and equality of economic and sporting opportunities. So the Union of European Clubs, fighting for those that aren't making, uh, fighting for those that, uh, no, they did not. Uh, As of right now, I don't think they've got, no, they did not pay for a blue check. But, yeah, the Union of European Clubs, and you can apply for membership. And uh, a f- uh, organization formed to promote a fair, sustainable, and balanced football ecosystem where clubs of all sizes can thrive in de facto open models of competition. So this sounds like Super League for the little guy. It might be the Sidekick League four card. Uh, it's, you know, and, and yeah, we got we got Premier League to talk about tomorrow because... Everything is leading to that match in the midweek with Arsenal and Manchester City. Yes, not quite the Super League. That's true, David. We're, we're the OK League. We're, we're the OK League. So that's I think that's kind of where you are. Uh, but yeah, we got that to talk about. We got the Prem to talk about. We got Spurs to talk about. We got stuff to talk about. Man U and PKs at 7 6. So you've got a Derby for the FA Cup final as City chases after the treble. But first things first, they got to get through Wednesday. And if they uh, if they beat Arsenal with uh, with how things are structured, that probably puts them ahead for good. At least it puts it back in their thoughts as they chase after Champions League, FA Cup, and the league. So, Premier League. Uh, Bart is Bart is traditionally Wednesdays at ten thirty because yeah, we got to talk about the, the the new sporting director being considered. For US, this is going to be a weird day because we're going to have to talk about a game that night. Yeah. Uh, so it's Open Cup Wednesday night. It is talking to Bart and Dylan Butler. And right now, Manchester City, two matches in hand, back by five points as Arsenal has drawn their last three, which has stunned everybody. Drawing Arsenal, drawing West Ham, drawing Southampton. Those were not planned, sir. So that's what you're staring at over the next little while. Yes. <laughs> show up early at the fraction and we'll just do the show live from there. Yeah, basically, because I'm done. So All right. <laughs> Jared, limit. Jared's done. He's coming back tomorrow. That's yes. awesome. So uh there goes Jared. And uh, we'll wrap it up here. Uh yeah, you know, so Bart traditionally is Wednesdays at ten thirty. So we got the stuff with US soccer to talk about. We got Refn to talk about, especially with what happened in the match with Atlanta United and forum shivers that didn't get cards. So I guess the way we'll phrase it with Bart is this. 
when it comes to those who are taller and uh, give the appearance of being stronger physically, how do you avoid a bias? I guess that's the first thing because, you know, it's like, oh, he can, the Cam Newton thing. Oh, he's a, he's a tall quarterback. Then therefore the hit is okay because he's 6'6", 240 or whatever. So we'll talk about, I guess, size biases and things like that and how you try not to, to get wrapped up in those as part of the deal. So, uh, yeah, so this is a busy week. Uh, high school action later today. And uh, it should be a good one, uh, finalizing the location and the OKs, but we'll keep you posted on uh, social network. Uh, Tuesday is normal. Wednesday, plan to have Dylan Butler and Bart, and we get you ready for Open Cup. And we'll talk about uh, Open Cup with all that kind of stuff. We've got uh, talking about Open Cup. Remember, on Thursday, the USL show guys are going to be uh, here at 10 o'clock. In the 10 o'clock hour, we'll talk about USL Championship in League One. So it's their week because it's the last Thursday of the month. And then Friday, it is normal 9 o'clock, 9.30 beyond goals, 10 o'clock weekend, whip around. We're back at it again as we're getting ready for Nashville. So it's high school playoffs. It's Open Cup. It's MLS. It's craziness. And that's the words to use. So uh, great to see everybody yesterday. Out at the uh, the tailgate, uh, excellent, David. Uh, Saint Pius. Oh, uh, hang on. Who is? Uh, yeah, and if you're and if you're in the market, and if you're close by and can catch catch a match that's high school, go ahead and catch a high school match. It'd be great. Um, who am I missing? Oh, Saint Pius hosting Roswell. Roswell was on the network on the girls' side, uh, beating River Ridge two nil last Thursday. So. St. Pius, after beating Glen Academy in 6A girls, hosting Roswell for a chance to get into the Final Four. And the winners play on Thursday to figure out your champion. A uh, lot of good matchups tonight, but the one that uh, we're trying to get on the air uh, should be a good one as well. Two top-ranked teams, two top five in their classification. We'll keep you posted on the network for that. So for everybody here, smash and grab. That's what happened. So... Uh, we'll do it again tomorrow. We'll do it again Wednesday. And thanks to all of y'all for being a part of everything here at SDH. So uh, for everybody here at SDH, for Jarrett, for Jason, for Nick, I'm just John. Play it safe, everybody. Thanks for hanging out. We'll do it again tomorrow at 9.05, I promise. I won't be delayed till 9.07 when we're talking about stuff because I'm trying to load highlights. So, uh, yeah, and don't buy the uh, Peeps-flavored Pepsi. Nasty. Anyway, be good, y'all. Play it safe. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 9.05. Mucha plot to y'all. And since it's the end of the show, that means that I get to do this. We'll do it again tomorrow. I'm going to be here before you know it.